God, our Father, as we come now to consider your word together and to hear its truths proclaimed, we pray that through it we might know the truth. We recognize how important this is. Our world resounds with lies and confusion and half-truths. And as long as we do not know what is true, we are lost. We are all at sea. And so we pray that you would help us to know the truth, and yet we know that this is not enough. And so we pray, too, that you would help us to love the truth, to recognize the rightness and goodness and sweetness of all that you say, to taste its sweetness and to hold it precious. We long that we might not only know the truth, but that it might capture our hearts And yet, this is not enough. And so, we pray too that you would help us to live the truth. Not to be satisfied with an intellectual recognition of what is true, even an emotional appreciation for what is true so that we are inspired in the moment, but rather that our wills would be impacted and our lives changed and our knees bent before you. Make us not just hearers of your your word, but doers of it. And yet even this, even this is not enough. And so we pray too that you would help us this morning to meet the truth. Actually to encounter the one who is truth. To be confronted by the Savior. To be addressed by Him. To know fellowship with him now together as we gather. And so speak your word to our hearts, we pray, and show us the Savior, that he might be glorified and that we might be filled with joy and hope. Here are prayers we ask, offered in his name. Amen. I recently saw an astonishing and terrifying video clip. It was taken by a man who was hiking in some mountains somewhere or other, and kind of in the foothills, but there were some higher snow-covered peaks ahead of him. And at one point, he heard an enormous crack and saw some snow up on these mountains or in in a kind of hollow between these mountains begin to move and begin to move in his direction. And so he did what you do when that kind of thing happens in the 21st century. He took out his phone and started to film. And he filmed, and the the, the video is mesmerizing. It is absolutely mesmerizing. You watch as this avalanche begins, maybe, I don't know, somewhere half a mile to a mile away, something like that. And, and it starts to get bigger and bigger and wider and wider, and it gathers pace, and it's heading straight at you. And it, it comes down the hill. You begin to hear the roar of thousands of tons of tumbling snow. You begin to sense the whole thing just shuddering and shaking as, as this avalanche bears down upon him, and it gets closer and closer and closer, and the man stands there filming it until it is upon him to the point that the kind of powdery snow being thrown out from the front of the avalanche is hitting the camera. And at the very last nanosecond, he takes one step to his right, where there is a massive rock And he just shelters behind the rock as this avalanche comes all around, all over, thundering everywhere. It's it's a heart-stopping video. You don't know, when you first watch it, you don't know what's going to happen. It's absolutely heart-stopping. And it leaves you wondering, you're not quite sure whether to, you know, is this man a reckless maniac or should I admire him for his courage? But of course, what he actually has 
is confidence. What he has is confidence that right there beside him, there is a rock that can take it. It can take the impact and it can shelter him. There is a rock of refuge. There is safety in the storm. This passage that we've read this morning has been precious to the church throughout the centuries. There's a lot of really obvious, just really obvious application here, isn't there? It's not hard to see. And it's right there on the surface. Jesus is with his people in power in the middle of the storm. With him they are safe. Looking to him, they are able to do great things. Taking their eyes away from him, they begin to sink. I mean, the text, you know, why am I here? The text just kind of applies itself, really, doesn't it? You just need to read it to get the, the central point of it. And in a sense, this morning, I, I just, you know, I kind of just want to let that happen and just feel the impact of that text. Looking to Jesus, we find safety in the storm. He is the rock of refuge. And whatever avalanche, avalanche of brokenness and pain might come our way, we are safe in him. But what I, what I do want to make sure we do this morning is to keep our eyes fixed where they need to be. Because actually, one of the ironies of this passage is that it's very easy in studying this passage to take your eyes off Jesus. We, even as we're talking about you know, Peter taking his eyes off Jesus, all of that stuff, it's actually very easy to look at this passage and, and to interpret it and to see it all in terms of the disciples or all in terms of Peter. And, and it somehow ends up all about us and what we must do and who, you know, all, all of that stuff. Uh, when one of the things that's very clear is that Matthew is telling us something about Jesus. This is, this is all about Jesus. So let me highlight for you now what is at the very center of the passage. And when I say it's the center, I mean that both metaphorically and literally. I have no idea. Okay, please don't think, I, please don't think I'm into the Bible code or, or anything like that. When I tell you, I have no idea if Matthew meant this or not. But in this passage, there is a phrase. And on one side of it, there's about 90 Greek words. And on the other side of it, there's about 90 Greek words. And there's an expression that happens right in the middle. It is at the literal center of the passage. It's the moment where Jesus appears and they're terrified. And at verse 27, he says, well, what does he say? Take heart. I am. Do not be afraid. That's what he says. Here's Jesus standing astride the waves, and the words that sit at the heart of the passage are, I am. Ego eimi. That's, that's the Greek. Translated here, because it's the natural way to translate it. It, it, is to be, it, it is the way that you would say that. If you wanted to say to someone, it's me, that's what you would say. But of course, every text has a context, doesn't it? And read in its context, these are profoundly significant words. Surely we are intended to see uh, more, aren't we, in this, this account of one who is displaying in his character and in his work the God who revealed himself to his people as, I am who I am, which is roughly what Yahweh, the, the, the name of God, the name that God gave to Moses. What will I call you? What will I tell the people is your name? I am, says God. And so this is how we can take heart as the wind blows and the waves crash. This is how we can not be afraid as the avalanche bears down upon us. This is the story of I am in the storm. And so as we fix our eyes on Jesus, I think we find four aspects here of, of who he is and what he does. So here's the first of them. See the tender-hearted shepherd who prays for his sheep. It's important to slow down long enough to see that. And the, 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 the eye of the imagination wants to rush on to the drama of the storm and the sea and the miracle of Jesus walking on the water and the lesson of Peter walking and then sinking. That, that's the drama, but slow it down. Linger for a few moments on the lead-in. We've just had the feeding of the 5,000, and then verse 22, immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. 
and evening came, he was there alone. What is Jesus doing? As the disciples are setting out across the lake, he is pouring out his heart to God. Remember what's happened. We read a few weeks back at the start of the chapter about how Herod killed John the Baptist, Jesus' forerunner, and his cousin and his friend. We, we saw how their lives have always kind of run in parallel with each other, Jesus and John, from before they were born. How Jesus' heart would have been heavy with grief, and how he would likely also have seen in John's death a foreshadowing of his own. And so when he received the news back at verse 13, he made to withdraw to a desolate place by himself. He needed to spend time with his father. But what happens? He's spotted. Someone sees him. And they follow him on foot from the towns. And although his own heart was heavy with grief, what does he do? Verse 14, does he say, look, I need some time. I just need some me time. Give me a break. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd. Verse 14, and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Um, in Tyndale's translation, when Jesus went out and saw much people, his heart did melt upon them. Lovely phrase. His heart did melt upon them. And so he laid aside his own needs and his grief and the heaviness of his heart, and he served the people. And he does this all day until evening comes, one healing miracle after another, and then the feeding of the thousands who have gathered around him. And now night has come, and this grief is still lying heavy on him. And the growing awareness of his own coming sacrifice is still lying heavy on him. And it's combined now with sheer physical and mental and spiritual exhaustion after the labors of a long day. There, and there is much more work before him. The need is endless, but, but now it's time. It says, you guys go on. You take the boat. You go on. I'll, I'll catch up. I <laughs> wonder if he said that. It'd be great, wouldn't it? I'll catch up. Don't worry. Um, you go on. I, I have something I need to do. It's not an isolated scene, is it? If you think about the Gospels. Over and over again in the Gospels, we're told that Jesus withdrew. He withdrew to a lonely place to pray, or he went up a mountain to pray, or he went into a garden to pray. He prayed in the morning. He prayed in the evening. At times, he prayed all night. It's a lovely um, verse in a hymn that we sometimes sing, O Sabbath rest by Galilee. You know that verse? O Sabbath rest by Galilee. O calm of hills above, where Jesus knelt to share with thee the silence of eternity interpreted by love. And so, well, there are two aspects to this. Here's a first simple application before we go any further. If Jesus needed this, can we do without it? Are we giving ourselves to prayer in this way? I'm sure when he prayed, Jesus would have asked the Father for all kinds of things, but I think the heart of this, surely, was, was just being with his Father. Wasn't it? It was, it was the enjoyment of communion with the Father, time with Him, time to praise Him. Uh, he, Jesus knew the great principle, the great principle that prayer isn't, isn't so much a way of getting things from God so much as it's about getting God. Prayer is not first about getting things from God, but about getting God. We, are, we have union with Him. There's a theological reality. Do we have communion with Him? Do we enjoy our union with Him? Do we take a hold of it? We do that in part by prayer. And I'm sure that Jesus, as well as knowing that great principle of prayer, I'm quite sure that He experienced the great paradox of prayer because I've talked about this before, there is a sense in which prayer is utterly exhausting. It doesn't happen without, without effort and commitment and the expending of spiritual energy. And yet, at the same time, it is this communion with the Father that fills us with life and vitality. You read, you read this account, if you read it closely, you think, 
Good grief, man, when did you ever sleep? Gets up off his knees again. And what's he ready to do? Miracles. Healings. Teaching. Prayer. Prayer has, has this astonishing power to renew the spirit. It is what we need. It should be like breathing. And John Stott put it like this. He said, men and women are at their noblest and best when they are on their knees before God in prayer. To pray is not only to be truly godly, it is also to be truly human. For here are human beings made by God, like God, and for God, spending time in fellowship with God. Let me tell you one of... There are, there are several quotes from Robert Murray McChain that terrify me. Um, he has quotes about holiness and ministers and things like that. But here's another quote from McChain that terrifies me sometimes. What a man is on his knees alone before God in prayer, that he is and nothing more. Is that not terrifying? What a man is on his knees alone before God in prayer, that he is. Nothing more. What was Jesus alone on his knees before God in prayer? He was the Son of the Father. So we learn from his example. But that, all of that is actually more or less on a side because the real, the real thrust of this, the real thrust in this text is that we benefit from his work. I, I think there's significance in the way that Matthew records this. Look again at the end of verse 23. Look where he goes with the, the flow of the, of, of the sentence. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. He, he puts the two things together. Jesus there alone, but the boat, this was happening with the boat. Mark specifically mentions in his account that from where he was, Jesus could see them out. They're several miles out, but he could see them out on the boat, straining at the oars, struggling against the sea. We can't be precise about this. We, 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 um, Matthew wasn't wearing a watch, I think, but um, Jesus seems to have headed up the mountain as night was falling, and he comes to them, it says, in the fourth watch of the night, which is 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. And so what you have, you put all the pieces together, and what you have is a significant period of time when the disciples are struggling on the sea. They're rowing and rowing and rowing, and the wind is against them, and they're not making much headway at all. And the boat is being beaten or battered, is the sense of it, battered by the waves. And Jesus can see this in the moonlight, presumably, because it's the middle of the night. And he's praying. Apparently, there are um, surprisingly few significant paintings based on this passage. Most, be aware, maybe be aware through history, most of the Gospels really, um, you come to an incident in the Gospels, if you go looking, there's paintings. Um, it's been such a, an inspiration for, for painters through the centuries. Um, most incidents in Jesus' life painted often, but this one less so. And where this passage has been painted, it's almost always that moment where Peter is sinking. You know, Peter's come out of the boat and he's sinking and Jesus is, is reaching out to him. That, that's what the artists depict. But seemingly there is one Victorian painting. I, I tried, I, I looked for it, I can't find it. Um, there is one Victorian painting which depicts the first part of the episode. So it's a, it's a big painting and um, almost all of the canvas is taken up with this raging sea. It's dark, um, moonlight, you know, it's just a raging sea. And, and a storm-tossed boat, and disciples straining desperately at the oars, and terrified, and it's dark, and it's dramatic, and there seems to be nothing but fear and danger. And then you notice over to the side, there's, there's just a, there's a hillside, and a, and a shaft of moonlight has pierced the clouds and fallen on the hillside, and there is a figure on his knees between the rocks. And that artist saw some, that artist paid attention to the text. He saw what Matthew wanted us to see. They were straining at the oars. Jesus was on the hillside on his knees praying. 
And he wasn't just praying for himself, was he? A significant moment, isn't it? If we just press pause there. Just pause on that scene. Picture the painting. Been looking at the the prayer meeting on Thursday evenings recently, been dipping into Hebrews and savoring its wonderful assurances about who Jesus is and about what he is doing for us right now as we battle against the waves. He is a priest, says Hebrews. He is working on our behalf before God, but unlike any other priest, he has risen from the dead. He is immortal. He is all-powerful. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. Peter, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you. Jesus prays for us. Just get the scene in your mind. Disciples straining at the oars, right there in the midst of it all, dealing with it all, but Jesus praying. See the tender-hearted shepherd who prays for his sheep. And then, of course, obviously, see the all-commanding king who has dominion over all things. Again, it's just this astonishing moment. Again, presumably moonlight. I don't, I'm guessing that's why the kind of, it's a ghost. You know, it would have been dark. They wouldn't have been able to see much. The spray of the water, the boat tossing around, all of that stuff. Um, it looks like a man, but of course it can't be a man, can it? Because he's walking on the water. So it must be a ghost, they say. And uh, as I mentioned earlier last week, we saw that the feeding of the 5,000 had all sorts of uh, subtle and not so subtle allusions to Moses, to the events of the Exodus. Um, and, and along with the provision of manna from heaven, the other great miracle associated with Moses was, of course, the parting of the Red Sea. Jesus surpasses it. He eclipses both of those miracles in a single day. And just the fact of his appearance, those, those, that, that miracle, the parting of the sea, was described in the Scriptures in, in some interesting ways. Psalm 77, when the waters saw you, O God, when the waters saw you, bear in mind that to the Jewish people that the sea was terrifying. It was out of control and terrifying, and they didn't want to go there. When the waters saw you, O God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. Indeed, the deep trembled. Your way was through the sea, your path through the great waters. Isaiah 51, God made the depths of the sea a way for the redeemed to pass over. Job 9, God alone stretched out the heavens and trampled the waves of the sea. Jesus is doing the things that God does. Everything about him shouts power, authority, supremacy, and he stands on the waves for, for various reasons, but one of them, I think, I'm sure, is to show his total command of all things. All things serve him. I don't, I don't know how many, how many atoms are there in the universe. Can you, can you even begin to conceive of the unimaginably astronomical number that there is? the number of atoms in the universe. I read, read someone say once, and it's true, it's true. If any one of them is doing its own thing, we are in trouble. If any one of them is free of the control and command of God, we are in trouble because God is not sovereign. God is not in control. The truth is, that whatever that unimaginably vast number is, every last atom obeys his voice. And so when Jesus steps onto the water and commands the, the, the water molecules to hold him up, they obey. They obey. Of course they do. He is their king. So his appearing is itself a claim to majesty and supremacy. And then those words, take heart, I am, do not be afraid. Mighty, momentous words. I think I've mentioned before, it's a silly story, but I think 
um, Lord Mackay of Clashfern when he was um, Lord Chancellor. And uh, there was a day apparently in the Palace of Westminster, um, you know, the kind of robes, he put on the full regalia, the whole lot. And he was quite an imposing figure, Lord Mackay. And apparently there was a day in the Palace of Westminster when he came out of a, came out of a room and he looked down the corridor and he saw Neil Kinnock at the end of the corridor. And he, he needed to speak to him. And in between him and Neil Kinnock, there was a group of American tourists being shown around the Palace of Westminster. So Lord Mackay came out in all his, all his regalia and he went, Neil! I would love to know if the story is true. The story goes that they did. I'd love to know if it's true. There's, there's something of that here, isn't there? But in, a, in an infinitely more powerful way, appearing in the midst of this storm, I am, do not be afraid, total command, utter majesty, utter impressiveness. And there, there are moments in the Gospels when Jesus speaks and his voice, it doesn't matter whether sometimes it says he cried out in a loud voice, sometimes he just speaks, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, his voice is like thunder. But the glory of it, the glory of it, of course, is that that voice that rightly terrifies those who stand against him also serves to comfort and reassure those who are his. Take heart. Do not be afraid. I, I've never counted. They say it's the most common command in the Bible. I, I can certainly believe it. Do not be afraid. How wonderful. Just make, make sure that you've got that in your quiver, by the way. Make sure you've got that in your quiver for the moment when somebody in your, your family or a friend or something says, ah, you know, religion, it's just all about telling you what to do. Make sure you've got that in your quiver. Yeah, the Bible does often tell us what to do. Do you know what it tells us what to do most often? Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Because if this Jesus is your Jesus, you don't need to be afraid of anything. Isaiah 43. But now, thus says the I am. He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you, for I am the I am, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior, and you are precious in my eyes. And honored. And I love you. See the all commanding king. Who for your sake. Has dominion over all things. Thirdly see the ever patient Lord. Who nurtures his followers faith. That, that's the point isn't it of. This incident with Peter. Peter. I mean, I mean, this is the movie moment. You know, the, the, this clip goes in the trailer, doesn't it? It's an astonishing moment. Peter grips the edge of the boat. You have to picture it. I missed my career as a movie director, I think. Just picture it as he grips the edge of the boat and, and, he, and he puts his leg down and he puts his foot down onto the water. And in that moment, well, in the movie version, somehow all the all the noise of the waves, all the clamor and everything just kind of dulls away into the background and you can just hear his heart hammering inside his chest as he steps down and stands. Looking at Jesus the whole time. He stands and he begins to watch Jesus come. Peter got out of the boat, verse 29, and walked on the water and came to Jesus. You ever notice it says he came to Jesus? I think I've always pictured this as he got out of the boat, took two steps and then boom, 
came to Jesus. He went all the way to Jesus. He was right there in front of him so that Jesus was able just to reach out when he did things. But he walked to Jesus. Just, just a few glorious moments until he sees the wind, which is obviously a figure of speech. He sees the storm. And, and at that, he begins to sink like, well, like a Petros. There's a Greek joke for you. Anyone get it? Peter, the rock, begins to sink. As I said earlier, the application is obvious uh, to the point that I don't think I need to drive that home any more than the text does. Just fix your eyes on Jesus. As Hebrews, the author and perfecter of your faith. In many ways, fixing our eyes on Jesus is what faith is, isn't it? To, to live by faith is to live with your eye fixed on Jesus. In the midst of the, the, the challenge that comes, the difficult time, the difficult word that's spoken to you, whatever it is, to, to fix the eyes on Jesus. That is to, to walk by faith. And that's the lesson he's driving home. That's the point. Um, back in chapter 8, we, we saw Jesus calm the storm. Do you remember what he says to his disciples? And they cry out to him. In the Greek, it's really dramatic, actually. In the, in the Greek, it's three words. It's translated in the ESV, save us, Lord, we're perishing. In the Greek, what they, what they do, they shout out to him. You got to, again, imagine the drama of this storm and the noise and, and thrown about all over the place. And, and, and they shout, save, Lord, dying. That's what they say. Save, Lord, dying. And do you remember what he says to them? Before he does anything else, before he calms the storm, Oh, you of little faith. Oh, you of little faith. Why are you afraid? And, and that expression is a single word that Jesus makes up by putting together other words. Oh, little faith ones, is what he says. Oh, little faith ones. Why are you afraid? And here... Peter, he saves Peter, and what does he say at verse 31? Oh, little faith, why did you doubt? It's interesting, Matthew refers to this disciple as Peter, but that's only because that's what he became known as. And when, when this happened, if the disciples were, you know, in the middle of that storm and they were shouting to each other in the boat, he would have been called Simon. That was his name. He's only called Peter from chapter 16 when he confesses um, Christ, Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God. And it's in response to that that Jesus says, I tell you, you are Peter, you're the rock. And on this rock, I will build my church. But I think it's helpful to take, the, they come in fairly quick succession, and I think it's helpful to sit them next to one another. It's as if Jesus gives Peter, gives Simon rather, this, this paradoxical new name. You want his full name? Peter Littlefaith. That's what he's called. Peter Littlefaith. Peter the rock. Littlefaith. The unstable one. That's what, that's what he's like, isn't it? You know that. If you know anything of the Gospels, that's what Peter's like. This one moment, that the next moment. You're not going to wash a centimeter of me. Wash all of me. I will never deny you. I don't know him. Peter Littlefaith. And I think the reason it's so helpful is that it's all of us, isn't it? That's the Christian life. That's the reality of Christian experience. We're all like him. I know I am. One second, with eyes fixed on Jesus, we can do anything. One second, there, there, there are moments when it seems impossible not to believe. Of course it's true. And, and the Lord is real, and he's present, and he's powerful. And, and, and five minutes later, there's a moment where all that exists is wind and waves and sea and storm. There's nothing else. Nothing under my feet to hold me up. And it turns out that this faith, which seemed so strong five minutes ago, is in fact little faith. But here's the thing. I, I, I really, the, the Bible is written word. It doesn't have tone, does it? How do you hear it? How do you hear the tone? Oh, you have little faith. Don't think so. 
he, he's using, he seems to have a, a Jesus seems to have a, a thing about nicknames, doesn't he? He likes to call people the sons of thunder, all that, that kind of thing. He likes to, to make up nicknames for people. And the fact that he does that, the fact that it's, it's essentially a nickname, little faith one. And um, it, it just, everything about this suggests to me a tone of, of affection. It's a tone of affection. Oh, little faith, he says. And his purpose is to draw out deeper faith. His purpose in all of this is to grow that little faith, to just pull it, to extend it. Let, let me show you how this can, you can trust me. Every incident, every word, he's just stretching this faith. You can trust me. At other points, he says, your faith is great, mainly to outsiders who come, not Israelites, often foreigners, unlikely people. Your, your faith is great. But here it's, it's little faith. And, and, and it's, just, it's just good news, isn't it? Good news that our Savior is patient with little faith. Like a parent, you know, you know the parent with a little child learning to walk who just delights in little steps. Delights in little steps, but also, also is always encouraging bigger, stronger, more confident steps. That never happens. There's a problem, isn't there? If your son in his 40s is stumbling along like a toddler and falling over at the slightest thing, Something's gone wrong. You look for progress. You look for bigger steps. It should happen. But it's nonetheless, it's one of the defining moments of parenthood, isn't it? A child takes two steps, and frankly, they're rubbish. They're rubbish steps. As steps go, they're really rubbish. You know, they're stumbling, and they're not really very straight, and they fall over at the end of them. They're rubbish steps. But they are glorious, aren't they? They're just glorious. Absolutely thrill your heart. And so, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. He's so patient. He smiles upon my stumbling efforts to trust him, and he lifts me up when I sink, and he shows me how trustworthy he is. Again, it's just how faith works, isn't it? it it's just this slow process. Your little faith doesn't go boom and, and, and take over everything all at once. That's not generally how life works. It's more like all the images. Think of the images in the New Testament about growth, organic growth. Um, that, that's, that's how faith works. The great line in Emily Dickinson, she says at one point, the truth must dazzle gradually or every man be blind. That, that's how faith works. The truth of God. God is dazzling. But he dazzles us gradually. He leads us in, and he does so with such patience and tenderness. And, and he does lead them on, doesn't he? Um, he gets into the boat, the wind stops, and by verse 33, those on the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. The word the isn't actually there. Truly, you are Son of God. Um, it's hard to know exactly how much to make of that language of worshiping and son of God at this stage. Soon enough, the disciples will make it clear that there's lots they still don't understand, but they understand more. The faith muscle has been strengthened. It's grown just a bit because of the ever patient Lord who nurtures his followers' faith. And then finally, just a few words on this last section um, that Matthew wraps up here at verses 34 to 36. The respite for Jesus has been brief. He's immediately back to the healing ministry. And this final aspect of his work that we find here, see the always loving Savior who makes his people wholly whole. There are, in the language that Matthew uses, he kind of piles up the, the absolutes here. They come to shore, and verse 35, when the men of that place recognized him, they sent around to all that region, and brought to him all who were sick, and implored him that they might only touch the fringe of his garment, and as many as touched it were made well. It's, Matthew is emphasizing the breadth of the work. I don't think we should get to, don't get hung up on the touching the garment, and whether that's, don't worry about that, that's not the point. Um, he's, he's stressing the breadth and the generosity 
of this ministry of Jesus. He is spending himself in love for people whose lives have been blighted by sin and by the effects of sin. Once again, his heart melts upon them and, and he brings healing. And one of the strongest expressions that Matthew uses is one that's hard to translate into English. And I really just want to finish with this um, because it's significant. The New Testament, um, you may be aware, has a number of words. It has three main words for healing. Two of them are words that doctors would use. Um, they're related to our words therapeutic and iatrogenic, if you know those, those words, where the, those words come from. Um, but, but there's a third word that you may be aware is sometimes used for healing in the Gospels, and it's the, it's the word save. Sometimes the, the text literally says that, that this person, this sick person, came to Jesus and he saved them, and meaning that he healed them but the language is used, I think, deliberately, and I think it's significant because it's reminding us, it's telling us that the healing work of Jesus is part of the saving work of Jesus. It's part of what he does when he saves us. He begins to heal us now. He heals us completely one day. And here, at, at the very end, when Matthew says that people were made well, he uses this word, he uses the word save, but it's not quite enough for him. And so he puts a prefix on it, meaning through and through. Dia. The diameter of a circle goes right through the middle of it. This is dia saving, saving that goes right through. He made them holy, holy. This is what he can be trusted to do. He saves to the uttermost. And ultimately saves not just our bodies, but everything and forever. The gospel is full of these absolutes, isn't it? Jesus is all of God. The fullness of God dwells in him. He is a, his, is a total salvation. All who come to him will be saved. No one will be turned away. They will be saved to the uttermost. So Matthew is giving you a picture of a tender-hearted, all-commanding, ever-patient, always-loving Savior who is for you as you learn slowly to trust in Him. He's telling you, He's showing you right in the very center of every storm you ever face. I am. Let's pray. Father God, help us to take these words and inscribe them in our church and in our homes and in our hearts. Take heart. I am. Do not be afraid. Thank you for this, this beautiful Savior, this tender, gracious, compassionate, loving, kind, self-giving Savior who exhausts himself for us, who, who prays for us, who serves us, who to this day serves us as our great high priest at your right hand. Help us to look to him and to find in him day by day all that he is. Help us to fix our eyes on him and to know ourselves safe wherever, whenever we are. We ask it in Jesus' name.